Hello, BookTube. The other day, I went to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston. Those of you who are new to the channel, that's a used bookstore in downtown Boston. It's quite nice. <laughs> I've been a customer there for a very long time. They have three floors of reasonably priced books on all kinds of subjects, double and triple stacked sometimes. And they also have a sale lot next door. With more books, thousands more books, for $1, $3, or $5, and on every subject under the sun, again, the same thing. And they're not junk. They're not mold and rain-stained old stuff like you might find outside, for instance, the Strand Bookstore in New York City. Uh, and the other day I went to the Brattle and I used as my flimsy excuse that it was a mild day even though we are approaching the middle of October, and that I felt like it was one last chance to go and browse around outside in the complete comfort of late summer. Uh, because I, I pay attention to the weather when I go to the Brattle, because I spend a lot of time in that outdoor, in that outdoor sale lot. Uh, but today was mild too. Lovely. <laughs> Quite lovely. It's entirely possible that what... I used to think of what we used to think of as late summer will now be winter. We'll just extend for the whole of, of the entire season of what used to be called winter, except for a couple of days that are bitingly cold. In which case, my flimsy excuse goes out the window or perpetuates forever. <laughs> Whatever, however you want to take it. It was too beautiful a day not to go back, so I went back to the Brattle Bookshop. The thing about the Brattle that if you if you hear me describe it as a used bookstore, you might underestimate, is just how often the stock changes. It changes all the time. They are out buying all the time and restocking both the sale lot and the store constantly. So it is entirely possible to go there every day and find something new. I know that for a fact because I used to work at a retail bookstore right around the corner from the shop and would go in literally every day on my lunch break. Almost never came back empty-handed. Almost never. Uh... The prices are so reasonable that you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about breaking the bank. And that outdoor sale lot, the books are only organized by price, not any other way. And there are thousands of books. So even if you spend an hour, I usually give myself about an hour, and you know, that will set to rights just about any kind of a rotten morning. <laughs> I, I usually give myself about an hour to, to browse around up there, not counting the time that I use uh, ranting and fulminating at the staff, whoever happens to be trapped out there. <laughs> uh, even if you do that and you're paying close attention, you're not, you're, it's just the way the, the human eyes and the human brain work. You're not going to see and register everything. You're going to need to go back. And you will, even if the stock hasn't changed, you will see things that you didn't, your eyes simply didn't take in the first time. And I did that today, and I got a pile of books that I want to show you. I know I know. I that every time I go to the Brattle, I say I got a pile of books. I didn't just get one or two. I got a pile. Once again, this morning, as most visits to the Brattle, I was dictated almost entirely by my carrying capacity. I didn't have to stop with money. I had to stop with how much I could carry without load, egregiously loading myself down. I could have filled my shoulder bag and filled two Brattle tote bags and maybe got twice as much stuff as I did. But in order to be comfortable, I had to mind my carrying capacity. But I still got a lot of stuff, so we have plenty to talk about. The first thing I would like to connect to a BookTube event. Uh, Brandy, the book eclectic, is doing a BookTube event called Hal for the Holidays, where she celebrates the science fiction author Hal Clement. Uh, he of Boston, he of Cambridge, he uh, a loyal, indefatigable foot customer in Boston's bookstores. He wrote a lot of science fiction, a lot of very interesting, smart, hard science fiction, and yet Brandy's right, he's not represented in science fiction. He's hardly remembered at all. He's never mentioned on BookTube. So, of course, I wanted to be part of the event, but she didn't invite me because she hates me because I smell. Uh, so I asked, well, okay... But can I maybe cheer you on from the sidelines and read a little Hal Clement myself? Because uh, I really like your channel. And she said, no, and also, the feeling's not mutual. <sighs> Pretty tough case. <laughs> but I got a Hal Clement novel anyway, The Nitrogen Fix. Look at this cover. Isn't that awesome? 
this is late, comparatively late in his career, and it takes place on an alien world that is, in fact, Earth. It's just a future Earth in which all of the oxygen has bonded with nitrogen, and suddenly it's you see the humans have masks on, the humans have to live in carefully oxygen-managed enclaves. There is an alien, <laughs> there is an alien in, in the world, there are a few aliens in the world, they can breathe the air, the nitrogen-rich air of this different Earth, quite easily. They have tentacles, as you can see. They are uh, intriguingly drawn, intriguingly well done. And because they're so at home in this transformed world, there are plenty of aggressive locals who think they transformed the world. That they're not only at home in this nitrogen atmosphere, but made it that way for themselves. It's not just a coincidence that they're comfortable there. And this is the story of... One family, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of world building here, a lot. So there's, there's a, this is a story of one family and one of those aliens. And the gradual understanding, the gradual revelation of what is happening, who the alien is, there's a plot that runs throughout here. And the specific MacGuffin-type plots are not Hal Cummins' strength. The world imagining, science world imagining is really his strength. I haven't read this since it first came out. Uh, when did this come out? 1970s? 1980. I, I, re I read this in 1980. This exact, not this exact copy, but this exact thing. An, an ace paperback with this cover. I was overjoyed to find it. This was uh, 275. Well, that was real money back then. So, Hal for the Holidays. A lot of you are probably getting to participate. I'm not. I'm banned from Hal for the Holidays, but I'm still going to reread this. I haven't read it in a long time. And while I was on the uh, the science fiction kick, the other mass market that I got was this. Patricia McKillop's book, uh, The Changeling Sea, with a great Michael Whelan cover there, about a young girl who loses almost everybody that she cares about to the sea in one way or another. Either they die there, or in the case of her mother, the sea unseats her reason. It, it drives her crazy, makes her monomaniacal. And this the girl, the main character in this book, which is kind of, sort of, quasi-YA, kind of, not completely, it's too intelligent and beautifully written, uh, the girl decides to declare a magical vengeance on the sea. And the plot just it folds out from there. Other characters are drawn in. This, uh, is this also the 1980s? 1988. Very happy to have it. This, this cover is slightly misprinted, but very happy to have this. I'll gladly give it another try, uh, another read. Both of these will. It's just, I mean, we're right around the corner from New World's November. So even if I'm not welcome in Hal for the Holiday, so then again... Considering the crappy job I did hosting uh, for Autumn or more, uh, I may not be welcome back for New Worlds November either. There's a perfect reason why I should have book two events of my own, because then I can't get kicked out of them. <laughs> uh, this next one is the great theater critic Walter Kerr. This is his book, Pieces at Eight. Not Pieces of Eight, but Pieces at Eight, meaning theatrical pieces at eight o'clock. He wrote for the old uh, uh, Herald Tribune in New York. He was their movie critic for a long time there, and really raised eyebrows. The people who had not known him all throughout his career. Because before he was there, he was elsewhere, even going all the way back to high school, he was reviewing things, reviewing theater productions in a very Walter Kerr type way. <laughs> There's a very, very two-fisted, take-no-prisoners way. Uh, but the larger world did not know what that was like. They had not experienced theater criticism like that until he did it for the Tribune. And then when that, when that paper folded, he went to the New York Times and just kept at it. And people would dread, people who had uh, Broadway shows would dread his review because if he didn't like your thing, he wasn't going to cloak his review in any kind of euphemisms. There wasn't going to be any, there weren't any soft bumpers to anything that he wrote. It could be vicious and it could be funny. And that's a deadly combination if a critic is out for blood, because that means that your reviewers are going to pay attention. They're going to enjoy your piece while they avoid the thing you're reviewing. He wrote, there's a big collection of his work. I've had it from time to time. I will find it. The Brattle will provide. I don't have a copy now. It's called Journey to the Center of the Theater. And it's terrific. It's a big, much more generous collection of his theater reviews. I'm sure that I will find it. I have seen many copies at the Brattle. I just 
always managed to either destroy my copy or, in a couple of cases, send it away. This, though, Pieces at Eight, is an anthology of his theater criticism before he went to the big time, it, while he was still at the smaller paper. So these pieces were written, this anthology was made, the whole thing about it was made, was published before that was known, before he, he achieved the complete height of his fame. And that means something to me. That, that often changes the reading experience for me. I, I'm assuming that it will here. I'm, these pieces, a great number of them, are probably in Journey to the Heart of the Theater, but I will read this anyway. Uh, theater criticism, absolutely. I'm not going to make a habit of it. I have a whole, almost a whole wall of book criticism, and I have told myself, you are not going to expand that to theater criticism and movie criticism. You just aren't going to do it, no matter how good some of it has been. But I will make an exception for this author because his, his theater reviews are terrific. Then we have something for the gays. Got to have something for the gays. We have a few things for the gays uh, this time around, but not all at once. We have this thing by James Lear uh, called The Low Road. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <clears throat> Uh, oh, <laughs> okay, the the, uh, the back of the dust jacket of a book is usually the place where you put blurbs or uh, synopsis or something like this. Here, the publisher, this is Clay's Books, decided to just go with their strengths. <laughs> and the, the uh, description on the top here says, Kidnapped by mercenaries, sold into sexual slavery. Can Charlie find his way back to Scotland and the man he loves? Are we 100% sure he'll want to? <laughs> I will definitely... Oh, what's this? Oh, it's, there's a packing slip in here. Interesting. Oh, there's a packing slip in here that is taped to the book. Oh, my. Take the warehouse employee who taped the packing slip to the book, bring them out behind the warehouse, and shoot them in the head. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, let's get rid of that. I have read... This is the... This, the cover says this is the author of the back passage all sorts of double entendres flying here i have read the back passage in fact i think of, i had a few of this author's works as ebooks in my great lost nook library the nook catastrophe that i will never recover from where on one of my ipads my nook app which was full of books it had four thousand books on it more than that almost five thousand and there were a whole string of these. There were a whole string of James Lear novels that are now gone. They are now gone. I have one now in, in a, a hardcover copy. I got print copies of a couple of his books at the in Brattle Book Halls, I think, a couple of years ago and got rid of them, sent them out to you. So now I have only one of these things. Uh, and it's one that I haven't read. So then uh, I don't know why I got this next one. One of the things that can happen at the Brattle when you're out there and you're you're in the sale lot and you're just, you're filling, you're grabbing books because there's no reason to slow down. There's no reason to take something out and, and seriously consider and weigh your, your, you know, your pennies here and there on a balance scale like that. You can just, you just grab things that interest you and you can winnow at the end. That's what I always do. I grab as many books as even remotely momentary, excuse me, interest me. And then when I'm done with all of that, I winnow out the stuff that was impulsive and that I don't actually want. And for some reason, I didn't do that today. So I ended up with this next book, uh, which is, I don't really, I don't really understand it. This is Edward Trelawney. This is his book on uh, Shelley and Byron, his, his sort of memoir of Shelley and Byron. It's a New York Review of Books classic with the, you know, the, the colored inside cover there and the, you know, you know, the setup, you know what these things look like. And I don't like the setup. This book has been reprinted a million times. There is an old Orange Spine Penguin classic that I, used to be the one that I had. I wrote all kinds of marginalia in that thing. Probably I would want that mass market again if I wanted this book at all. Maybe there's also a Penguin Black Spine trade paperback. I wouldn't be surprised. This thing has a weird life of its own. Trelawney was, uh, was referred to even in his own day as Lord Byron's jackal and was... <sighs> A snapper up of petty trifles. It was a, a, a ridiculous, lying, sycophantic hanger on who was largely viscerally disliked by everyone that knew him. He wrote uh, this, a kind of a reminiscence of these famous poets, in order to make some money off them when they were dead. He outlived both of them. And the David Crane, 
Oh, okay. David Crane is the author of the book, Lord Byron's Jackal, which is a biography of Trelawney. And he has a blurb here saying, in his Byron and Shelley, Trelawney creates two figures that are in their own compelling solidity are fit to stand alongside any literary memoir shot, short of Boswell's Johnson. That is certainly not true. And I might want this book, but I know I don't want this edition. I don't know why I grabbed it. I don't know why I did. Or why, having grabbed it, I didn't get rid of it. I didn't winnow it out. I didn't winnow at all. I was so busy chatting with the staff and ranting at the staff and joking with the staff and whatnot. It's, this is connected. I mean, I'll, I'll read the introduction here. The introduction is by Ann Barton. I'll read the introduction. Maybe I'll keep this volume. It's connected with the next book that I got, this great big thing from Johns Hopkins University Press. This is by James Bieri, and it is a big, fat biography of Percy Bysshe Shelley. This thing is, what have we got here? 830 pages long, so it's good for doorstop or doom. And it's a, bi a Shelley biography I haven't read. There was a big two-volume biography of Shelley from 150 years ago. You see them in the big hardcovers. I've had them from time to time. Make very I don't remember the writer at all, but they make very sumptuous reading. And I have the, speaking of the New York Review of Books, they did a reprint of Richard Holmes's book, Shelley, The Pursuit, which is an incredible biography. Not just an incredible Shelley biography, but it is that, but an incredible biography. And New York Review of Books did a paperback reprint of that, but it's much nicer than their usual ones. It's, first of all, twice as big tall, twice as, as tall as this, and it has a floppy binding instead of the crappy binding these things have. Shelley, the, my, my copy, my paperback of Shelley, The Pursuit, has lasted through two rereadings. This thing certainly won't do that. Not at all. The cover will pop off after halfway through one reading. I've read those two Shelley biographies, the, that big two-volume one. I'm blanking on all the details of it. A big two-volume one from 150 years ago that I found at the Brattle, the kind of thing you find at the Brattle. And then uh, the Shelley, The Pursuit. But the, here's this, which I have never read. Always up to, to rectify that. Maybe I'll read them together. It's kind of impossible to read a Shelley or even a Byron biography without dealing with Trelawney in some way. It's kind of kind of impossible, even though probably you should discount almost everything that he writes. I got them together, and they were dirt cheap. I just don't, I don't know why I got a New York Review of Books paperback when I don't like them. <laughs> There's only a couple of them. I like the Anatomy of, Mel of Melancholy that they make, and I like that Shelley the Pursuit, but as far as I know, that Shelley the Pursuit copy is the only one they've ever made in that size, with those dimensions. Most of them I don't like. This is a perfect example of... of I know people who have whole bookcases of these things, just looking like that, and I I don't particularly like them. I don't know why I didn't winnow it. Maybe I was I was influenced by the fact that I was getting a Shelley biography, which is going on my reading list fairly soon, a big 800-page biography. Then this next one is also a biography. I've had this. I read it uh, and I think wrote about it when it first came out. I've never seen this Riverhead Books edition. This is a, a kind of attractive. It's a nice floppy trade paperback. This is uh, A. Scott Berg's biography of Max Perkins, the, the great editor of Thomas Wolfe and Hemingway and Fitzgerald and uh, Marjorie Keenan Rollins and a whole bunch of other writers that, that whose works are canonical largely because Perkins made them that way. The, he, he would get raw, bristling genius on his desk, and he would make it presentable in a way that improved it. Uh, I remember when this book was first coming out, I think this was the 1990s, when this book was first coming out, I, uh, Oh, no, 1978. Okay. Uh, I, okay, so I did read it. I didn't review it then. Somewhere. I reviewed it for somebody. I wonder if I'm in here. There's a huge amount of blurbs in the front of this thing. Just a gigantic amount. Page after page of them. I wonder if I'm in here. Oh, I don't know. But either way, uh, I was skeptical that this could work. I was skeptical that you could do a long and interesting biography of an editor editor is mostly sitting down all day just deal, fiddling with semicolons but this was my first taste of Berg as a biographer and he's great he's a great biographer if he can make me interested in reading 800 pages on Lindbergh he can do just about anything and this is fantastic not only as a biography of Max Perkins but as a glimpse into the literary world of his day and I had never seen this this uh, trade paperback so 
it, a chunk of it will be worth a reread. There's one particular part of it that I want to reread. And then the rest of it, you know, it'll be on the shelf. I'll, I'll go to it when I need it or if I want to read a literary biography. Then we have uh, a study of a literary phenomenon, the modern library, which has to come from the same person who recently sold the Brattle a ton of modern library volumes. They have just hundreds and hundreds of modern library volumes. New-er-ish, older and very old. So you get, you get to see all the different sizes and shapes and formats of the modern library, and you get their origin story. You can't help but remember it. When you're looking at very old, little mass-market paperbacks of the modern library, you can't re help but remember I can't help but remember the origin story of, of the modern library, which connects with a woebegone figure, a fascinating failed Byronic figure called Horace Liverite from the publishing world. Someday, if it hasn't been done already, I don't think it's been done already, someday there ought to be a biography of Horace Liverite. What a figure. He and his partner came up with the idea of uh, cheap, readily available classics. Consider them at first to be window dressing. Consider them at first to be, you know, I'll tease you with this because I want you to buy that. But as usual, as was true with Modern Library and it was, it was true de uh, decades later with the Penguin Classic line, if you give the reading public a great low price classic line of reprints, they'll make it a success. And the key isn't that they're hungry for the classics, although they are. The key is the price. <laughs> the key is the price. If you did that same thing today, if you made a series of $4 hardcovers of the classics and put them in bookstores, they would sell out immediately. They would You would have a massively winning property on your hands. Obviously, since Barnes & Noble understood that, certainly, there were a couple of, of old of old salts in the, the home offices in New York and Barnes & Noble that actually sort of kind of remembered the old publishing days of, of the Martin Library and Horace Liverite. And, and Barnes and & Noble Literary Classics, the Barnes & Noble Classics line in paperback, went exactly along those lines. They were often had originally commissioned introductions and notes. They could very much be worthwhile volumes, but they were also very studiously the cheapest version of any of those books that you could get. If you went into a retail bookstore 15 years ago and you were looking for a copy of Pride and Prejudice and you didn't care anything about it, you were only concerned with money, which is a lot of what people are concerned with when they're retail shopping. And you went up to the drone at the desk and said, where is, where is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen? And you went and saw eight copies and the Barnes & Noble edition was $2 or more lower, cheaper than any of the others. You would get that. Plain and simple. That would end the decision. You would get that. That's what the Modern Library understood, and it, it, they became a hit unexpectedly. And somebody, I had no idea this was true, Jay Satterfield wrote a book on Modern Library, on the whole phenomenon of Modern Library. Uh, that starts at, this has, what do we have, a description here? In October 1930, Macy's Department Store in New York City used the inexpensive book series The Modern Library of the World's Best Books as a loss leader to draw customers into the store. Selling at only nine cents a copy, the small format modern heart, modern classics attracted crowds of buyers. Businessmen, housewives, students, bohemian intellectuals, and others waited in long lines to purchase affordable hardbound copies of works by the likes of Tolstoy, Wilde, Joyce, and Wolfe. It was a significant moment in American cultural history, demonstrating that a series of books respected and praised by the nation's self-appointed arbiters of taste could attract a throng of middle-class consumers without damaging its reputation as a vehicle of serious culture. I haven't read this. I'm amazed. I did not know this book existed. And I love Modern Library. I'm going to snap this right up. Of course, it's going to make me long for a book that was not at the Brattle today. I looked. I don't have a copy. I looked. <laughs> I came back and looked. I've had a copy many, many times. The, the book is a memoir, a publishing memoir by Bennett Cerf called At Random. Bennett Cerf bought the Modern Library and made it into Random House. And I, his memoir, At Random, is really good. It's one of the best publishing memoirs. And I've had copies many times in the past. I've had copies here at Hyde Cottage many times, but I do not have it now. I must have sent it away, so I need to keep looking for it. The Brattle will provide. In the meantime, 
I found a book today. <laughs> I found a lot of stuff today that I wasn't expecting. And this one I did not know existed at all. So there's a history of the modern library that I didn't know existed. That's one thing. But the fact that this book exists and I didn't know about it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> this is by William Dowling, and it is called Oliver Wendell Holmes in Paris. Medicine, Theology, and the Autocrat at the Breakfast Table. <laughs> there he is. This is a book about Oliver Wendell Holmes studying medicine in Paris. A young Oliver Wendell Holmes studying medicine in Paris. This is Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., not the son who was on the Supreme Court, but the autocrat at the breakfast table, Mr. Boston, the most Boston Brahmin of Boston Brahmins, including right, right down to the detail of not having been born in Boston. <laughs> this I have so many books by or of or about Oliver Wendell Holmes. I have so many of them. I never knew this book existed. It's incredible. This will be all about his study of medicine in Paris, where he learned a lot that was contrary to the medical winds of the day in America. A lot. There was a new uh, school of thought going through the medical professions in Paris at the time that he was there, and he absorbed it all. He was already a published poet, he was already a, a budding literary figure, but he was a doctor, and he absorbed this, this new idea, first of all, to get rid of a lot of the old ideas, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the old ideas that have now made a comeback, bleeding, uh, you know, cupping, that sort of thing, all of those quack remedies that all the, the YouTube health influence, all the 20-something health influence, are all doing it now. So they'll, they'll post a video of themselves going into the gym to, to lift weights and grunt to copyright-free rap music. And when they turn their back to the camera, you'll see all these symmetrical bright red circles because they just went through a cupping session. Utterly ridiculous, complete quackery. Not only that, but medieval quackery. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Two students in two separate states in the United States have advised their parents to bring a lawsuit against the school because they wanted to study the four humors in science. In their science class, the completely fraudulent, dis discredited, medieval idea of the four humors. As far as they're concerned, folk science is science. Folk science is science. Folk science is science. And little Timmy isn't content with just being wrong. It's folk science is science, or I'll sue you. <laughs> uh, Holmes went to Paris at a time when those ideas were being discarded. I'm pretty sure that the leading science men of the day, the leading medical men of the day, would have been appalled that any of these ridiculous medieval stuff would come back. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> this is a whole book about that period of Holmes's life that I didn't know existed. Does it have references? I'll bet it... Oh, it has a lot of them. Oh, my God. <laughs> And lots of notes as well. Oh, my. All right, well, <laughs> I have a whole shelf, almost a whole bookcase, of Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. stuff to the point where I found so much of it over the years and just bought it, you know, religiously. I just buy it. I found so much of it over the years that I've often wondered if it isn't the brattle god sort of nudging me towards writing something about Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who's now totally forgotten. He was the author of a book and then all of its sequels that was born of a column in the Atlantic Monthly, which is a magazine he came up with a name for it. It used to be in Boston, called The Autocrat at the Breakfast Table. And when the when the auto, when his columns, The Autocrat at the Breakfast Table, was made into a book, it sold like crazy. Everybody loved it. Everybody knew it. Everybody in everyone in the Western world knew it. And really, really waited for every sequel. Uh, he's not remembered anymore at all now. But that's never stopped me before. <laughs> so this, is, this is quite possibly the find of the day. Then we have a historical novel, I think. I might be an element of fantasy involved in it. I've got a lot of questions about this book. It was a dollar, so I grabbed it. It's called The Forbidden Mountain. It's a novel by Hebe Wienosen. Uh, and it's got a Greg Hildebrandt cover. I confess, it's the Greg Hildebrandt cover that did it for me. That it's a historical novel about prehistoric Britain. 
set in prehistoric Britain, this book is based on a legend that was passed down by oral tradition through more than 2,000 years until put into writing by the monk Geoffrey of Monmouth in around the year 1136. Its central event, the transportation of the Blue Stones, describes the origin and building of the world-famous ruins at Stonehenge, or more precisely, the building of what is now known as Stonehenge II, or Blue Stonehenge. Indeed, the novel could not have been written without an acknowledged debt to the works of archaeologists. I don't know this thing. I think it might be straight-up historical fiction, but I don't believe that Hebe Wee-Nolson ever existed. What kind of a name is that? What kind of a person is that? I don't know this, name, uh, this author at all. I refuse to believe that she's real. And when I l looked at the back of the book for the author photo and description of the author's career... I was not convinced <laughs> that, that she's real. I'm not sure that she is. But uh, this, this is one of the luxuries that is afforded to you by the outside sale lot at the Brattle is that the prices are so cheap you can take a complete flyer on something. I have never seen this piece of art by Greg Hildebrandt, first of all. I will take a complete flyer on this and give it a try. <laughs> and we'll see. Maybe it's really good. In which case, maybe the author did exist. <laughs> then we'll return, we'll return one last time to the gays. We've got to have something for the gays. We'll have something else for them. I get this all the time. I get this book all the time. I've had it in paperback, UK trade paperback, many, many times. I have. A, I bought the hardcover when it came out originally. Uh, I always manage to get rid of it. I always manage to send it away to somebody, give it away to somebody. So when I saw it today, this morning... Uh, I realized, remembered right away that I didn't have it, and I'm always up for a reread. I may do a reread of this author's entire work, since I now think I have all of it. <laughs> uh, this is Alan Hollinghurst. You've seen me haul this book many times. This is The End of Beauty, The Line of Beauty, with this great American cover that is the wrought iron gates of a gorgeous landscape, a gorgeous property. It's really well done, if you know the story. The story is of a, a young man named Nick Guest, who is the sort of the uh, the mascot and family friend and pet of a very wealthy family in England in the 1980s, in Thatcherite England. They are pure creatures of staggering, sybaritic wealth, and he is not. He's from a normal middle-class family. So this, the wrought iron gate, the the lavish property right out of reach behind it. It's actually a very well-chosen cover illustration. And it has the decalage and everything. I love the book. I think it's a fantastic novel. And I revisit it sometime. It's been probably five years since I read this. It could easily do it again. I'm a big fan of this author. So maybe I'll save this and do a reread of everything. I just recently got the swimming pool library here uh, on a, in a brattle hall. I just recently did. So maybe I'll get I'll, I'll put them all together and do just a soup to nuts reread. The next one is, <laughs> the next two are Bibles. I have a lot of Bibles here. A lot. <laughs> but I get them anyway. I love the Bible. I love reading it, either huge chunks at random or systematically. So when I find one that's interesting that I don't have, I grab it, especially if it's a dollar. I found the New English Bible with Apocrypha, this this thing here, which I will I will reinforce this. I will I will clean it up a little. It's in a little bit ratty shape, but I may know passages from this thing. But I'm sure that I haven't read much of it. I, I could stand to read a huge amount of it here. Maybe I mean I have a bunch of Bibles here, many different kinds. I don't have this one. Didn't have this one as soon as I saw it. I remembered that. And then the next Bible isn't really a Bible. It is. It says that it's a Bible. But it is one of the best-selling Bibles uh, that has ever been made in the English language. A lot of you will recognize this. This is a children's Bible. With this is the, You get the copies of this are often very beaten up. And this one is in, still in relatively good shape. But it has these kinds of illustrations all throughout. There are illustrations on every page of some kind or other. Some of them are only spot illustrations. Some are far more elaborate. Uh, the walls of Jericho coming down. Uh, see that? All throughout. The, these pictures are all throughout. They're everywhere here. Uh, all with this. I wonder if they credit the artist. I, w I had a copy of this just... Oh, this was presented to... Uh, children 
from Arcus's in 1971. Okay, so maybe a family or a couple called the Arcuses, and they were presenting to the children of their friends, just in toto, not any one particular child. I wonder if they credit the artist. I don't recall that they ever did. Uh, no, no, they don't ever do that. They don't credit the artist. How interesting. Uh, but this goes all the way to uh, the New Testament as well. There is... Saul being struck from his horse by a blinding light on the road to Damascus. This thing ended up in a million households. This thing sold better than any almost any Bible in American history. And once upon a time was an absolutely standard fixture in schools. Not just Catholic schools, but anywhere. It's a little bit odd. <laughs> it's, 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 you know this picture? You must know what that is, right? You know what's happening there? It's a little bit odd. I've spent a great deal of time in the Middle East, and aside from myself and a few gin-sodded British expats, I never ran across any white people. <laughs> this book is entirely full of white people. The, the, the only people who have any adventures in this book are white people. <laughs> Nevertheless, this, of course, is not a translation in any way like the New English Bible. Instead, it's an, ad it's an adaptation for children of great Bible stories, and it I, if I remember correctly, very pointedly leaves out the worst Bible story series. There's a, a human wrestling with an angel. Huh? <laughs> and and you, get, you get that wrestling picture. And you'll get an account of Jacob wrestling with the angel. But you won't get an account. There'll be no mention in that account and certainly no drawing of how the angel is bested <laughs> in that account. The, it, Jacob pulls a very particular move on a very particular part of the anatomy in order to win that wrestling match. You'll never see it. You'll never see that in an adaptation like this. And so, since you don't, you will lose any hint of the earthy humor of the original. It's just the way bottlerizations go. But I, when I saw this, I, I, it's in good shape. A lot of times they're not. A lot of times these are falling apart. This one has one structural problem right there. See see that right there? The text block is almost coming off in the middle there. So this probably won't survive a lot of concerted reading. I am content. I don't know if this is still in print. There might be new editions of this to get. But another one will show up at the Brattle. And when this one dies, I can save the artwork. I can save a lot of the artwork which is fine by me. And then the final thing I got is oversized. I try to, to be very parsimonious with getting oversized books. They tend to be white elephants. They tend to attract and seem really neat, and then they just sit around because they're ungainly, so they don't go, in, they don't go with you when you travel somewhere. And they end up just getting taken out of a box and put, in on, a, put on a shelf and then put back in a box two decades later and moved to some new location. So, since I know that, I try not to have many of them, but this one I'm going to use. <laughs> I have a sweet tooth, uh, one of my many literary sweet teeth, for English country houses. I've read the histories of a huge number of them. I've spent time in a huge number of them, both as a kind of a, a lowercase g guest, where whoever invited me is the only person who knows me, and everyone is being very nice and counting the hours until my room is free, <laughs> counting the hours until I'm gone. But I've also been in quite a few English country houses where I was a, an uppercase G guest, where it was, it was the couple that run the house that invited me. Everyone knew me, and no one was waiting for me to leave. Everyone was hoping I wouldn't, was hoping I would stay. Just go on staying. Just stay as long as you like. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of food. Stay as long as you like, especially if the dogs are behaving. If you're getting our dogs to behave, you can stay as long as you like. Uh, part of that is probably the reason, but I also find it fascinating. I just find the whole subject fascinating. Now, you might think, as a, with that as a preface, the thing I'm going to show you is yet another big, oversized picture book of English country houses. I'd like to think that I have enough self-control not to get one of those things. I have enough of those books as it is. I have enough of those books already. So even if a really pretty one showed up at the Brattle for $3, I don't think I would get it. But this one's different. <laughs> this one's different. This is the English country house in perspective. And it has that 
all throughout. Cutaways of the houses. Cutaways of where things are and how they are in relation to each other. There's still a lot of black and white and color photography to show you what these places were like. And there are, of course, floor plans. You get, when you're an English country house fan, you get really good at reading floor plans. I'm, I'm pretty good at reading the, the details of floor plans. But in addition to that, you get this. Cutaways of what was where in relation to what all throughout the house. I've never seen an English country house book anything like this. I didn't know that one existed. This is wonderful, absolutely wonderful, in taking me into the little nooks and crannies that I will never be in again. I will never set foot in an English country house again. So I got this with a clear conscience because I don't have another English country house book like it. My only worry in getting it uh, was that it might tempt me to write a NaNoWriMo story set in an English country house when I cannot be tempted. I should not be tempted about NaNoWriMo. I have settled on what I want to do for November. It's time to start working on it instead of still batting back and forth between ideas. And the thing that I want to do does not have anything to do with an English country house. So this this will serve as a temptation, but I'm hoping I can resist it. Uh, but that there you go. That was the brattle. For today, a beautiful, beautiful, clear, cool morning. Just a delight to be out there. For me, not necessarily for the staff members that I that I pigeonholed, but for me, a delight. <laughs> uh, so we have the English country house in perspective. An indulgence, I admit. But then we have the children's Bible. A lot of you will know this book. A lot of you will have had it when you were growing up. Then the New English Bible. Uh, doesn't have much, I don't think, in the way of critical apparatus, but I will take books selected at random and just see what the reading experience is like. We have The Line of Beauty by Alan Hollinghurst, uh, a gay novel. He, the Nick Guest has a black lover, and he falls. He is very much in love with one member of the family that he that he's sort of attached to until they break ways. Then The Forbidden Mountain. Do any of you know this book? I don't think you do, because I don't think it's real. I still don't think it's real. Uh, then we have Oliver Wendell Holmes in Paris, Good Lord, by William Dowling, I, I, the one person in the world for whom this book was written, and I, I now have a copy. The World's Best Books, A History of the Modern Library, which will have necessarily a lot of Bennett Cerf in there, but it will have also a lot of Horace, of Horace Liverite, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Max Perkins, editor of Genius, in a nice floppy new trade paperback. Trelawney's book about Shelley and Byron in this New York Review of Books paperback. Uh, it's still a mystery to me from the Brattle of this morning. But also James Bieri's big biography of Percy Bysshe Shelley, which will draw on Trelawney, as they all do, but I've never read it. Imagine, an 800-page biography of Shelley that I've never read. Then The Low Road uh, by James Lear, <clears throat> with a couple of things to recommend it. <laughs> Uh, I had a lot of those of this author's work. I think I had all of it, and now it's all gone. Then Pieces at Eight, an early collection by Walter Kerr, the great theater critic. The Changeling Sea by Patricia McKillop, a really great prose stylist of fantasy. And The Nitrogen Fix by Hal Clement, a science fiction novel set in a transformed Earth that I haven't read in forever. So a very successful brattle trip, a brattle trip full of goodies. <laughs> That I will get to. I have a lot to read in October, but I will work a lot of these into my repertoire. I will work them into the rotation of stuff that I need to do. I, I had a lot to read this weekend. I didn't actually get to all the reading that I had to do this weekend. It spills over into the week, but I will make room for these. Now, I want to tell myself that the thing that I will read first, the two things I will read first, will be the world's best books about the modern library and Oliver Wendell Holmes in Paris. I want to tell myself that those two things are the two things that I will read first, but it is easily possible that I will read the Hal Clement and the cutaway book of English country houses first. <laughs> it's entirely possible that that will happen. I will inventory these and fix up the ones that need fixing up, and then much later on, hours and hours later, at midnight, I will decide on my night's reading. One of these things will be in that reading, if not more than one, and who knows what it will be, the responsible choice or not. <laughs> but anyway, this may not be the only Brattle trip this week. <laughs> so if there is more, I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.